Well, my story is a little bit different than most. I was uh, born and raised in a, a Mormon family. And I remember as a middle, in my middle teens really seeking and, and searching for God and, and relationship and, and meaning and, and what I believed. And becoming very, very frustrated and, and uh, not finding the answers I was looking for. Um, and uh, during this time of sort of frustration and whatever, I remember even having a, a dream, very powerful dream one night. And uh, in that dream, uh, God, Jesus had come back. And uh, I remember running, running to him and him looking at me and, and, and plainly saying, away from me, I never knew you. And I remember waking up from that dream being very, very distraught and upset and really not understanding the, the reason or the meaning of it. And it was only a year or two later that uh, a friend of a friend of mine and invited me to come to uh, the church that they attended. And uh, I'd gone to church lots and I thought, what, what could the harm be of that? So I um, went to church and I remember sitting in the back row of the church and, and listening to the the pastor preaching and watching the people around me and it, and it was a charismatic church so it was very different than anything I'd ever experienced before but I remember uh, the Holy Spirit just grabbing me in a very powerful way and thinking to myself that that everything that was preached made sense and that this this was what I was looking for and uh, I had to go back uh, there was no choice I remember my friend going so what you think after and and I'm saying I got to come again because this is this is really powerful. And it was only a, a few Sundays later that um, that I, I went forward and accepted Jesus into my heart, uh, into my life as my Savior. And uh, and only a, a few Sundays after that that I was water baptized. And during the weeks that followed, uh, I remember you know reading the Bible and praying and 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 God just speaking to me in such a powerful way. And opening my eyes and taking away the, the spiritual blindness that had existed and things suddenly made sense uh, in the Bible and the things that I had questioned for so many years and um, and God has has walked with me since so that was January of 1980 so in the 33 years that have followed um, you know God's always been with me and there's been plenty of twists and turns and bumps and falling down in my life and getting up but but the bottom line is God has always been with me and I'm very excited about what God is doing in my life at this time and, and in the life of my my family and we uh, came to the Red Deer area about uh, six and a half years ago and we really enjoy being a part of the Crossroads family and uh, we're very excited to to see what God is going to do in the Red Deer area we, we need to hear stories like Warren's because um, we need to know that God is still actually changing lives. We, we read about it in the Bible, and indeed on Sunday mornings we're doing a little series called Jesus, Friend of Sinners, where Jesus encounters sinners of various kinds, and their lives are transformed, changed by that personal encounter with Jesus. And when you hear stories today like this, you realize that the Jesus that once was still is still encounters people. So I want to introduce you to another character today, um, a, a friend of Jesus. His name is Nicodemus, and his story is in John chapter 3. You may well have heard of Nicodemus before. It's a well-known story, but a good one. And just to sort of um, get you up to speed with John 3 and Nicodemus, let me tell you that if you've never read the Bible before, a great place to start is in the New Testament, second part of the Bible, the book called John. It's a very easy to read and understand book. It centers on the life of Jesus, and in particular, focuses on conversations that Jesus had with individuals. Some of them quite extended conversations. Um, here in chapter 3, an extended conversation with a man named Nicodemus. It, you turn the page, and he has an extended conver conversation with a woman at a well. John seems to like recording conversations that Jesus had with people. And he's different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in that regard. All four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are called Gospels. They're written about the life and teaching of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke are very, very similar. 
Mark was a friend of Peter, probably Peter's disciple, and probably got his account firsthand from Peter, the disciple of Jesus. It seems that Matthew and Luke would have uh, immersed themselves in Mark's document and then written their own, using Mark's as a base to work from so that you get uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke sounding very the same. But John is different. John just loves to introduce you to people that were engaged in conversation with Jesus that became life-changing conversation. Let me read you this one in John chapter 3, um, this great story of Nicodemus. It goes like this. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with them. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he's old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You're, you're Israel's teacher, Jesus said, and you don't understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because he's not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men, that means people, love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. This is probably the greatest sermon ever given by the greatest preacher that ever lived, Jesus. This is classic evangelism. It's all here. All the great questions that you need to ask and have answered are here in this one great sermon or talk that Jesus gave. Um, who is Jesus? It's here. Um, what is the new birth? How is a person born again? How is a person brought into a right relationship with God? What did God do to make that possible? All those questions are answered here. You won't find a better um, explanation of the gospel of Jesus and God than what you have in John 3. And I, I'd like to um, just unpackage it briefly as you would any sermon. Most sermons that are any good have a main point. And then they have two or three points that support that big premise. What's the main point here? The main point that Jesus is trying to make is this. How can a man or a woman be made right with God? That's his main point. He's going to tell you three times here how a man or a woman can be made right with God. His answer is by being born again. In verse 3, 5, and 7, he'll say, a man or a woman is made right with God by being born again. So that's his big, big point. How can a man or a woman be right with God? Anybody, anywhere. How can they be right? By being born again. He has three points to make around that. The first one is in the first three verses, which is this. Everybody, with no exception, needs to be born again. That's his first point. Everybody, with no exception, 
needs to experience the new birth if they're going to be right with God. He presents us with this character, Nicodemus, who came at night. And I know a lot of people have spilled a lot of ink on what it means that Nicodemus came at night. Some people say, well, he was a Pharisee and he shouldn't have been seen with Jesus, so the most obvious time to come would be night. Other people feel that perhaps that was when Jesus had freedom, no appointments, so he had some leisurely time with Jesus. I, I think the point is just this, that Nicodemus came to Jesus with his questions. That's the big point. Who cares whether it was day or night? He came to Jesus with his questions. That's not a bad thing to do when you have questions, is actually take them to Jesus. He will give you the time of day. He'll listen to your questions. He'll address your questions because he's the same today as he always has been. That's why we need these stories to tell us that he'll treat us the same as he treated these people. If you have questions, just find your way to Jesus any way you can, any time you can, and lay your questions before him. Now, how does, how does um, John here uh, uh, unpackage this sermon of Jesus so that we see right up front that everybody, with no exception, needs to be born again if they're going to be right with God? He does it by choosing this story of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is not a notorious sinner. He's not like some of the people we've already met. In fact, he's one of the world's good people. This is a guy that uh, presumably has never cheated on his wife. He probably hasn't watched porn either. He hasn't cheated on his income tax. By all accounts, you're dealing with a man of great integrity, one of the world's good people. One of the people that you would say, God surely wouldn't send that person to hell, would he? That's who you're dealing with here. You're, you're, his deserving qualities, if I can put it that way, are just up front right in the first three verses. One, he's a Pharisee. I know that word pushes us back, but in Jesus' day, this is what a Pharisee was. They were the Bible-believing people in Jesus' day. Pharisees, religious. They studied the Bible. They believed the Bible. The Bible they had was the Old Testament. They would tear it apart and read it and absorb it and get it into their DNA. And they were hyper, we would say, legalistic. They were determined to obey every point of God's law. And they had it all spelled out in about 600 laws. And in case they didn't nail them all, they added some of their own too, just so that they wouldn't miss. They were meticulous I'm trying to keep this stuff. They would, add their, they would come to a commandment like, like the Sabbath. Take a break. Take a rest on the Sabbath. They not only would do that, but they would, they would spell out a whole lot of situations that they would actually follow as well. Some of them got crazy. Let me, let me, th these are two that are absolutely true. One of the laws that they added to the Sabbath law was if a, if a woman, she shouldn't look in, the, in a mirror on the Sabbath day. Because and, and, if she looked in the mirror on the Sabbath, she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out on the Sabbath, and that would be work. So you weren't allowed to do that. So another thing they said, uh, true, is that they, um, you could eat an egg on the Sabbath if a chicken laid it on the Sabbath, only if you killed the chicken the next day for laying the egg on the Sabbath. I mean, that's how crazy it got. Um, it seems weird seems hyper-legalistic, but behind it is this passionate desire to know the Bible and to put it into practice. These were good people in everybody's eyes. He was also, it says here, a member of the Jewish ruling council. That would be the Sanhedrin. It was a Jewish political deal. Uh, it's a way of saying you're dealing with a leader, a religious man, a Bible-believing religious man, a leader. Now, when he fits those two categories, you'd have to add to it, and a scholar. Because to be a member of the Sanhedrin and a Pharisee, you would have had to have had a Greek education, which very few people had. You're dealing with a scholar here. So, John couldn't have painted a better picture of somebody more deserving to be accepted by God than this man, Nicodemus. He's a good person. Now, when, when you... When you get what Jesus is trying to say here, that he puts Nicodemus on notice and Nicodemus doesn't meet the grade, you are confronted with one of the very uncomfortable truths of the Bible that ought to astonish you. This is what the Bible says right up front. Three times it says this. It says there's not one good person on the planet. I, 
You know, I think about my neighbors that are good people. I think about my friends that are good people. I think about all these good people, and I think God surely isn't going to judge them the way he's going to judge notorious sinners, is he? And then I, and I'm confronted with this statement, and it comes first in a troubling way in Psalm 14. And it says there, there's not one person on the planet that's good. In fact, it says that God scrutinizes people, everybody from heaven, and that's God's conclusion. And in case we miss it, it's reiterated again in Psalm 53. Let me just read it to you just so you know I'm not making this stuff up. But in Psalm 53, if I can find it, I'll read it to you. Here it is. It says in Psalm 53, it says, The fool says in his heart there's no God. They're corrupt and their ways are vile. There's no one who does good. There it is, no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on all the sons of men and all people to see if there's anybody down there who understands or who seeks God. Everyone has turned away. They've together become corrupt. There's no one who does good, not even one. That's God's assessment of the planet. There's not one person that does good, not even one. Paul will pick this up in Romans 3 and repeat it there. Just in case we haven't read the Old Testament, he'll insert it in Romans 3 so we get it. Now that's, that ought to astonish you. That's what God says. And I, I know people that I think are pretty good, but God says no. So how do you put that together? I put it together this way. It seems to me that in these statements of Scripture, it's not saying that people um, um, have nothing in them of value. What it is saying is this, that in terms of finding acceptance with God, there's nothing good that we've done or could do that would qualify us for his approval. Nothing. So that's where he starts with Nicodemus. He's saying this to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, there is nobody that can see the kingdom of God, no exceptions, unless they're born again. Because nobody's good enough, Nicodemus. Not even you. With all your qualifications and all your good living, Nicodemus, even you don't make the grade. That's, a, that's an amazing statement that Jesus is saying to Nicodemus and to those of us that listen in on the conversation. Nobody, not even one Nicodemus, is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Just, just so you know, in verse 3, where he says, kingdom of God, there's only two places in John where John uses that little phrase, kingdom of God, and they're both in this conversation. If you were to flip over to Matthew, Mark, Luke, you'd find that, word, that phrase all over the place. John substitutes another phrase for kingdom of God, which is this, eternal life. John uses that as a synonymous term for kingdom of God. So what Jesus is saying is, Nicodemus, I'm telling you, no one can inherit or get or have eternal life unless they've been born again. That's what he's saying. And, and verse 3 is very, very important because this is one of the weightiest things that Jesus will ever say. So John sets Jesus up in this conversation the way he writes it. Um, normally, the way a writer would craft this material is introduce Nicodemus like he does in verse 1 and Jesus in verse 2 by name. And then normally in verse 3, he would say, in reply, he declared, because we've already met Jesus. But, but John goes, in reply, Jesus declared, using his personal name again, just to give us a bit of a heads up that this is very important th stuff that's going to follow. And then these words, I tell you the truth. In other translations, it's more accurate. It says, truly, truly, Nicodemus, I tell you. It's meant to get his attention. When Jesus ever says, truly, truly, or I tell you the truth, what he means is, what I'm going to say carries the utmost weight. If you're going to miss everything else I say, Nicodemus, please don't miss this statement. Nobody can ever be right with God without the new birth, being born again. Now, this blows this guy's mind, of course as it does many people. So Nicodemus says, how can a man be born when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. He's using these words can and cannot. He's, he's, he's giving himself away. Nicodemus lives in a world where nobody has split a Red Sea. Nobody has been raised from the dead. His world is limited by human possibilities. That's what's happening here. And he cannot see further or beyond that. Now, it's intriguing to me what Jesus says to him because in my world of pastors, we often say things like this. So, 
What kind of spiritual journey are you on? And what would be the next step on your journey? You know, how, how can we get you from where you are to just the next step? Jesus doesn't do that kind of stuff. He, he just blows them apart right at, the, right at the starting gate. He doesn't say, let me tell you how to take the next step. He just cuts them off at the knees and says, Nicodemus, you're going nowhere unless you're born again. Let's start there, Nicodemus. Nicodemus wants to go forward. Jesus is trying to take him back and get him born all over again. And, and I, the tragedy of people like me that read the Bible so much is that we're not astonished by this stuff anymore. It's just predictable because we've read it. So this, is a, this is radical, radical teaching here that Jesus is presenting. You can't do one thing to fix yourself, is what he's saying. You can't do one thing to help yourself get right with God. It, 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 it's, it's beyond you. You're unfixable. That's what he's saying. You're beyond hope. So Nicodemus's question is appropriate. How, then, can I change? How can I be right with God? How can I be born again? And that's where Jesus comes in with his second major point, and it's this. Nicodemus, unless... The Spirit of God moves in you. You can't be born again. To be born again is an operation of the Spirit of God, Nicodemus. You can't do it. Let me say this to you and me. Unless the Holy Spirit of God has come to you and worked in your inner being, you are still dead in your sins. That's Jesus' teaching. Nobody can be born again unless the Spirit of God brings into life. Let's just listen to what Jesus says. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God or find eternal life unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Then he goes on, flesh to flesh, spirit to spirit. Now there's two ways of understanding this. Let me tell you what they are, and I'll tell you what I think Jesus is saying, and what the big point we ought to get out of this is. It could be that Jesus is saying, um, you can't be entering the kingdom of God, find life, eternal life, unless you've been born physically through water, and then secondarily by the Spirit. That's the immediate context, but the context behind the passage is probably, most likely, Ezekiel 36. And in Ezekiel 36, you read these words, and I'll read them to you in Ezekiel 36. They're powerful words. God says, I am going to sprinkle clean water on you, and you'll be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. The prophet Ezekiel is looking forward to a day when God would actually sprinkle clean water on people and then take the spirit and put the spirit in them. And the spirit would then move them to live a new life because he would breathe life into them and bring them to life. I think that's the background to our present passage in John chapter 3. Whatever way you look at it, the main point is this. Unless the Spirit of God has brought you to life, then you have no life. You have no eternal life unless he has done that. Um, John will tell us in a moment what God has done to make that possible, but for the moment, understand that it's a work of the Spirit. I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to um, look at this as John uh, uh, probably um, working with this conversation and causing Nicodemus, I would think, to reflect back on the baptism of John, which he would have witnessed and which would have perplexed Nicodemus. And when Jesus talked about being born of water and the Spirit, I think Nicodemus would have gone there too to that baptism in the Jordan River that he'd witnessed. Now, here, here's how a person becomes Christian. Just understand this, that when a person realizes they're unfixable, and then they realize that only God can change them by his Spirit, and then they are pointed to Jesus Christ who paid their sin, and they trust him, at that moment the Spirit of God enters them, they confess their sin, and then they're baptized and then they move forward in their Christian life. Um, that seems so clear from Scripture, and I, I just want to belabor this point for a moment because it's critically important. Um, if you have heard the good news of what Jesus did on the cross, if you've confessed to him your sin, then I believe God puts his spirit in you and at that point breathes life into your spirit and you're made new, born again. You give evidence to everybody that that's happened by being baptized in water. 
The two are absolutely linked together. Believing Jesus died for my sins and giving evidence of that by being baptized in water. Seems to me that if somebody says, I believe in Jesus, but has never been water baptized, there's not much grounds for believing that they really believe in Jesus. Um, the, the two acts were always joined in Scripture and went together. The public baptism was a declaration that, yes, I've encountered the Spirit of God. He's breathed life into me. I'm a new person. If you can't submit to the words of Jesus at that point when he says, believe and be baptized, then there's very little reason for believing that you'll submit in any other area of your life, like your sexual life or anything else. If you can't submit at base one, you won't submit anywhere else. So this is critically important stuff we're talking about here. And, and this, it's as mind-boggling to some of us as it must have been to Nicodemus. Now, how does God make the new birth possible through the Spirit? That's the rest of the, ch the, the conversation, where Jesus takes over, and Nicodemus kind of fades into the background from this point. He, he wants to tell Nicodemus how God made possible new birth by the Spirit. He says, Nicodemus, let me go back in your history. You study the Bible. Remember Numbers 21. Remember there, Nicodemus, where um, the Israelites had sinned against God, so God sent venomous snakes into the camp, and they began to bite the people, and the people began to die. And, and God said to Moses, Moses, if the people want to live, take, a, take a, 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 a piece of bronze and fashion it into that snake and put it up on a pole. And everybody that's snake-bitten can look at that snake and live. Now, Nicodemus, you remember that, don't you? And you remember that when the people looked at the snake, they were dying, they looked at the snake, they lived. Nicodemus, I'm sure he says, yeah, I remember that. Jesus says, well, look, here's what God did. God knew you were sin bit. You were dying in your sin. And he didn't take a snake, he took his son, and he lifted him up on a cross, and he became sin for us. And if you look, Nicodemus, to Jesus on the cross, you will live. It's that simple, Nicodemus. Um, Jesus on the cross is not Jesus trying to appeal to God in heaven to be merciful because of what he's done. It's actually an expression of the heart of God, the deep, deep love of God for his sinful creation that he gave his one and only son to become sin for us, to take our sin and to pay the full penalty. You have to do nothing, Nicodemus, but believe that. Whoever believes, Jesus said, shall not perish but have eternal. Believe means trust. It means to entrust yourself just to what Jesus did and God did at the cross. Don't try and fix it. Trust that Jesus paid it for you. Nicodemus, at that moment, a person is brought to life by the Spirit of God. This verse and the next one um, kill two major lies that um, a lot of the Christian community has bought into. One is this, that Jesus only died for some sins in the world, but not the sins of the whole world. There's actually Christians around that believe that he didn't die for the whole world. But John is very clear. And, and if he's not clear here, in 1 John he's even clearer where he says, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, the body of belief, and also for the sins of the whole world. He died for, the only qualification in terms of getting forgiven and getting right with God here is twofold. One, that you remember the world. Two, that you trust Jesus. Those are the qualifications. Now, the other lie that's a big one that's um, put out there is that God is out to condemn certain people or groups of people, and Christians are notorious for that. We hold signs up and say things like that at different times. But I read John 3:17. And it says God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. God is up to saving you, not condemning you. I need you to know God is for you today, and he's not condemning you. He's trying to save you. He's trying to get you to look at his son Jesus and say, I paid it for you. Trust me. I, I can give you new birth, but you have to trust me. That's what he's trying to do. So I, I want to just wrap this up very quickly by, by just saying three things. One, one is this. I think when you read um, this story or listen in on this conversation, it, it ought to push you back to the place where you say, am I sure that I've experienced a new birth? You can't read this without going there. I mean, we're talking about one of the best living guys in the world coming up short. 
and needing to be born again. That means we all need, am I sure? Now, he was a religious type, a Bible-believing type, which most of us would maybe fit in that category. So I don't think it's unfair to say to Bible-believing people, uh, have you had the new birth? Or are you just, you just like hanging out with Christians and love worship and love the stories? I mean, the deal is a personal encounter with a person named Jesus Christ who by his spirit can bring you to life now and forever. Second thing I'd like to say is this. A lot of you have questions, big questions, good questions, that if you, if you could get a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, you'd love to ask him. I think this chapter encourages us to say he loves to hear our questions. He's, he's got time to listen to them. So I want to encourage you to take your questions to him. How do you do that? This way. Not here physically. Um, but he sees everything that happens and he lives and he moves amongst us because he rose from the dead. I think one way that I've done it that I'd put out to you is I have a bit of a journal. It's just a notebook. Not, journal sounds like leather bound and everything else. This is just a rotten old duotang notebook, but it's my journal. I write my questions out in there. So on Mondays when I hang out more with Jesus than other days, I, I write questions in there that I have for him. And I wait for him to answer them. He doesn't always answer them Monday. But I live with those questions throughout the week. And I listen for anything that might tie into the question that I've asked. And I note it. It might be in my reading of the Bible daily. It might be in talking to a Christian friend. It, it might be in a thought that comes strongly to my mind. It could be a million ways. But I write down the things that I think Jesus is saying and answer those. He, he's real. He talks. He speaks. He answers questions. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, if you're unsure, even if you've heard from them after you've written that down, then talk to some of us that have walked with Jesus a little longer and let's sit together. Let's try and figure out if maybe Jesus hasn't answered some of these questions for you. But if you have questions, please take them to him. You know, sometimes pastors are one of the biggest obstacles to people getting to Jesus. And, and you, you, you make that problem worse by, by not going to Jesus yourself, just coming to us. I mean, we'd love to help you, but our job is to connect you with Jesus, not us. So seriously, we'll, we'll help you with your questions, but we'll, we'll help you take the questions to someone that can really answer them for you. Does that, that make sense? Third thing I would say, finally, is this. Is that when you've been born again, you also have been entrusted with this message of the gospel. Entrusted with it. In other words, when... The Father in heaven looks at Central Alberta today. We're it. We're the people that have to get the message out. He has no plan B. Uh, our watch is now. If we drop the ball here, then there are people that won't hear the message. So um, our job is to take the message outside these four walls and just communicate clearly. Jesus is the Son of God. He didn't come to condemn you. He died on the cross for your sins, and if you trust him, he will forgive your sins and give you eternal life. That, we're, we're the people to take that out, but we take it out in the spirit of Jesus. Not arrogantly, not pointing a finger, but like one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread, we point people every day, all the time, to Jesus, the Savior of the world, who still powerfully changes lives right here in Red Deer in central Alberta. Let's stand and pray. Father, today we thank you for the wonderful experience of being in your presence with your people. And I, I know, Lord, that, that you are present with us because it says in the last book of the Bible that you walk around in your church. You search our minds and our hearts. And Lord, I pray that um, all the things that you see in us, that you would deal with us in grace and in truth. I pray, Lord, that you would work to draw us closer to you today. I pray the things in, in this whole service that have been of you would just take root in our hearts, that we would not quickly lose them. I pray, Father, today that you would teach us what it means to simply trust your Son, Jesus Christ, and not try and fix ourselves. I pray, Lord, that you would give us courage and boldness because we live across the street from people and it's, go to school with people and work with people that think this is crazy stuff. And sometimes, Lord, it's hard to talk about it outside these four walls. And we ask that you would fill us with your spirit because we need courage. 
Lord, some of us need courage here just to step up to the plate and act on what you've been saying to us for a long time. Maybe just something like getting baptized and publicly saying, I'm in. I submit to Jesus, who's Lord. I follow him. So, Father, whatever you want to do with your word, please do it. Don't let it fall to the ground, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.